Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray. And uh, no, folks, we're not back in our normal haunt inside Renaissance Bank, but uh, hope to be back soon. Um, in the meantime, though, Renaissance is open. They're just open to uh, uh, not to walk ins, but, to, you know, for folks that uh, have an appointment. And you don't have to be a bank customer to have an appointment. And if you are not a bank customer, there's a reason why you would want to go into Renaissance Bank, and that is because you have not had a personal experience uh, with your current bank, uh, your current mega bank that um, may or may not, in your opinion, care whether you do business with them or not anymore. So uh, if you're looking for someone that answers the phone uh, with a live person, uh, for your business, get in touch with Renaissance Bank. Uh, Renaissance is, um, uh, we, we know about them personally. Uh, and, and so I, that's, that's why we endorse them. Um, go to renaissancebank.com. You can find uh, your local, their local office uh, uh, in, somewhere in the south, 200 of them, ready to serve you and uh, uh, check them out. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now I want to welcome Janet Hagerman. And Janet is with DSOs Done Right. Janet, welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. It's great to have you. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, for those that don't know you, and there's a few that don't know you because you're you're out there doing great work but there's a few that don't know you uh, give an introduction to you and the work you do with dso's yes well um, i've been in the dental industry for over 30 years i practiced clinical dental hygiene for years i've done coaching full practice coaching as well as hygiene specific coaching and um, my focus has always been on communication and leadership skills um, I had the opportunity to work as the director of hygiene for a large DSO, about 150 offices at that time. So it was a great opportunity. Working in a group practice is a great opportunity because as you develop systems and protocols, you get a chance to see um, it in action very quickly over the platform of many different practices. So you get to see rather quickly what works, what doesn't work, and how you can correct and tweak things quickly uh, to improve your systems. Um, and then in the meantime, I've, uh, I've written a couple of books and uh, I had a mentor uh, that I asked one time, what is your, what are your top three strategies for being a great speaker? And he said, without a doubt, write a book, write a book, write a book. So ah. package your wisdom and write a book. So I, I did uh, on communication skills for, for dental practitioners and, and working on another one now on the whole uh, structuring. How do, you, how do you set up a DSO? So um, my focus has uh, tweaked a little bit more to a, this very specific niche in DSOs, which is a huge niche, but a very specific one that's helping uh, young emerging DSOs, group practices, build the foundational building blocks to be able to scale. By scale, I mean grow in terms of uh, acquiring new practices. Sure. Be able to do that in a way that's predictable and smooth and is consistent with the company brand or, or culture. So for those that don't know the term DSO, why don't you define that and, and talk about why uh, DSOs have developed. Sure, yeah. Uh, we, you and I may, and many of your listeners may remember a time when dentistry was basically one practice, one dentist, maybe they had a hygienist. Uh, over the years, um, doctors have expanded and decided, you know, I'm on this side of town, but there are people on the other side of town that need my services as well. So um, I worked last year with uh, a practice, a fairly small practice that has 
one office in Buckhead, which, as you know, is probably you know one of our most upscale practices. The mm. financial district is there. The governor's mansion is there. So that's more of a high-end practice. They also have a practice uh, in Woodstock, which is a more rural community. So two mm. very different demographics, but they serve two different different needs. So, and then you may have uh, situations where, well, now I have two practices and I kind of like this. Uh, we're doing well. So uh, acquired three and four and over the years, um, this concept has grown. DSO stands for Dental Support Organization, mm. and it means a group practice. So just to give you a little background, um, when they first came on the scene, they were considered a disruptor, sort mm-hmm. of a, a dock in the box kind of thing that just was, you know, cattle in, cattle out, didn't give real good uh, quality dentistry. That has so changed over the last years. So right now, as of 2019, there were, just to give you a breakdown on the size of DSOs, there were 25 companies that had over 100 locations. Now, right now, the largest DSO has, they just broke 1,000 last year, 1,000 locations all across the country. So what I call the big boys or girls, um, the, the bigger ones that have uh, over a hundred locations. There's only 20, about 25 of those companies. Mm-hmm. Now the next mm-hmm. level down, the more regional ones between 20 and a hundred practices or locations, that's about a hundred companies that serve anywhere from 20 to a hundred locations. Mm-hmm. Then we go to the emerging groups that are anywhere from five locations to 20. It doesn't seem like very many, but there's almost a thousand of those out there. So that's a big number. And um, those are the ones that I try to help. By the time you've gotten to 150 practices, you've got most of your systems in place. Still room for improvement with uh, protocols and things like that. But these young practices that jumped on the bandwagon and were in a position to acquire some offices, but as they want to scale, as we call it, or acquire and grow, uh, it's really important to have a culture in place, a very clear culture, and we can talk a little bit more about how important that is, Mm -hmm. Um, and then what systems are going to be, and how big do you want to grow? Do you want to be 25 practices and then sell to another larger DSO, or do you want to get to grow to be 100? Um, so determining that early on is really important in how you grow. That, that's, what I, that's what I love to help with um, these younger DSOs, ensuring that they um, project the, the, the mission that is important to them in their community to end up with loyal patients and loyal employees. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Janet, because um, it's easy – to say that you want to scale your business and you want to grow and you want to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's a whole nother thing to execute that. And sometimes people jump into that without understanding the implications of what scale is all about. Um, And I I imagine that's something you walk prospective, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess folks that want to scale, you walk Mm -hmm. them through that, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, because with a lack of organization, a lack of direction from leadership, and and we've seen some amazing examples of this with with COVID, but with a lack of good leadership, you end up with unhappy, disgruntled employees, fearful employees, and that translates to employees that don't take good care of their patients. So happy employees are happy to be where they are and they take great care of their patients. So um, COVID was a a very good example of, you know, leadership or lack thereof. And I was just so um, happy and proud to see the the, the leadership in the DSO space step up and um, really take a stand for how important dentistry is. You know, it was considered a non-essential business. So dental offices all across the country were shut down where, you know, liquor stores were open. Not that I want my liquor store to be closed, but, you know, everything from hardware stores to veterinarians. You could take your cat to have their teeth cleaned at the vet, but you couldn't go to your own dental office. Now, you know, a lot of them stayed open for emergency reasons, so our 
emergency rooms were were overpacked. But um, uh, we really saw. I I thought I really saw the the DSO dental leadership uh, really uh, stand up and and uh, do some incredible things. Really lead. Um, so I think that's going to be force in the future. Uh, right now, the latest statistics are something like 70% of dental practices are private or solo practices, and 30% of offices are part of some sort of group. Um, actually, that number surprised me that it was so low. And it's, I mean, the trend is there. It is not going away. The DSOs are here to stay. They're going to grow. It's it's going to continue to be the business model of the future or the and the present. Um, and they're just going to continue to get better and, and better and increase in quality patient care. Folks, we're here with Janet Hagerman. And she is with DSOs Done Right, uh, had her own consulting practice for many years. Uh, um, you must have started when you were really young, Janet. I did. I was four. <laughs> there you go. You were precocious. Um, um, I'm, I'd like to talk more about DSOs, but I'd, I'd like to talk about you for a second. So what, what you started in the industry, what, I mean, what got you passionate about the subject of communications in a DSO and led you to, to, to starting your own consulting practice? Yes. Well, I will never forget one of my earliest patients that, um, halfway through my, we, we call it patient education in the, in the dental field. Um, we, we take classes in patient education, how to tell people what they need. And I was on a roll when my patient reached up and patted me on the arm and said, little lady, you know, in the South, little lady, <laughs> right? dispense with a lecture. I have an important business meeting to go to. Just hurry up and let me finish my appointment. Mm. Now, um, I doubt if there's a clinician in dentistry that hasn't had a similar experience. Maybe their patient was uh, not as vocal. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, it just got me thinking. Of course, I was embarrassed at first. I was very young. I was I was right fresh out of school. And I just thought that I had the gift of gab. And, and just by patient educate, they said, you know, if you educate people enough, they will um, – you'll be successful mm-hmm. at what we call case acceptance. So, you know, you come in, John, and I say, you know, that filling can't be replaced and it's broken. You, you need a crown. And and what happens is we overwhelm people with information. I call it the information dosage. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a saying that real education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. And what we do in dentistry is we fill people's bucket. And if they don't get it, we fill it some more. And if they are a deer in the headlights, we just keep telling them more and more information. Where what we need to do, and this is, you know, I studied this for years to, you know, how do we really get through our patients um, to help them see the value of this amazing work that we do in dentistry now. The technology is just so fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, um, you you know, how do we light their fire of curiosity? And the first thing we need to do is zip it. (laughs) We need to quit talking and ask more really good questions to Mm. find out patient values. So those are the types of things that I studied and had an opportunity to teach when I was in a large DSO myself to teach those skills and see the results. So that was the result. I had um, a mentor that I asked one time, you know, what is your, what are your top three step strategies for success? And he said, write a book, write a book, write a book. Mm. So he, I did it. He said, package your wisdom and write a book. So I thought, well, what am I passionate about? Um, and I had so many dentists that would say, you know, when you come into our practice, could you teach my team how to sell dentistry? Because I know it's walking out the door. I hear them say things that I just cringe, but don't call it selling dentistry. Nobody likes to think that they're selling, you know, dentistry. Mm-hmm. Well, we all are always selling something. Um, you know, even if it's just selling somebody on our point of view about something, selling sure. your kids on the idea to do your homework and get good grades, we'll go to Disney World, you know, whatever. So, um, so I wrote a book selling dentistry ethically, elegantly, and effectively. And it's all totally based on um, clear clinical diagnosis. I mean, we're not selling somebody a bill of goods that they don't need. That That's not even in the picture. Clear clinical diagnosis, but it's all based on 
uh, trust and relationships and discovering patient values. So mm-hmm. I like to say trust is your treasure and relationships rule. Um, so it's helping people, giving them uh, communication skills to help their patients appreciate the value of what your dental practice can do for them. Wow. So, I mean, a lot there. That's, that's awesome. Um, wisdom. One of the things that strikes me in listening to you, Janet, is that you mentioned that dentist, and this is true for all professions, so I'm not picking on dentists. This is true for all professions. Um, we, we tend to overwhelm our clients with information when, when really what clients can sometimes be moved by is emotion. And I can see that being the case in the dental industry, particularly right where somebody might be afraid of a particular procedure or something like that. And information is not what moves them. I am so glad you brought that up because um, we know research over and over shows that the majority of of healthcare decisions and actually buying decisions in general We do not make those buying decisions with logic. We make them with our emotions. Mm. Um, Now, my husband will argue that all day long because he's a logically focused kind of guy. But um, that's what studies show. And so um, when I do my presentations, I have a whole right brain, left brain thing that I that I talk about. Um, We need to sell from the heart, not the head. Mm. And because in dentistry, we are so technically oriented, that's what we learn to do. I mean, our world is a dark hole this big, and we deal in millimeters. If a crown fits, you know, we deal in millimeters. So um, it's a very exact, precise science. But when we're talking to patients, that's not what's going to grab their heart. What's going to grab their heart is when they feel that you have the empathy towards what their values are. And um, uh, what you talked about, uh, a patient who is fearful, for example. I teach three values, uh, different values questions. Like, what's the most important thing to you about your dentist or your dental office? And typically, they'll fall in one of three categories. Pain, as you just mentioned, or um, money. I'm, I'm worried about I, I don't want to pay for what my insurance doesn't cover. And time. These are the three things that keep 50% of the population from going to the dentist. Only 50% of our our population visit a dentist regularly. Mm. So if you can determine what your patient's trigger point is, that patient I told you about earlier that said the little lady, he was a bank president. He wasn't afraid of going to the dentist. He had money for whatever treatment he needed, Mm -hmm. but he was time crunched. And had I known that, I wouldn't have educated him. I just would have said, uh, Mr. Smith, I know how busy you are with your business, and you have meetings and you have presentations. Let us do this now at your convenience rather than waiting for it, something to blow up when you're getting ready to get on a plane and go to a meeting. So I would, I would explain that same situation three different ways to three different patients that had three different values, even though clinically it was the exact same problem, exact same tooth, exact same quadrant, but I would explain it differently. If they want clinical information, they'll ask me, and then I can share that. But I think we do have a tendency in many industries to overwhelm people with technical information, telling them how much we know when that's not really what they need to hear. What they need to hear and feel is how much we care. Was it John Maxwell, I think, that said people don't care how much – care how much you know until they know how much you care. I think that was it, John Maxwell. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. That's but that's become a cliche, and it's it's a yeah. cliche because it's true, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, for sure. Uh, I think you may have answered this question, but I, I'm going to ask it anyway. I mean, uh, we so for those that are not DSOs, you know, what kind of commonalities – exist in the work you do for DSOs versus other service industries? Well, I think anytime you're, you're looking to expand, number one, I think culture has become more, 
you know, we, we've seen a spotlight more and more on, on culture, mm-hmm. no matter what the business is, what, <clears throat> what is it that we're trying to do for people, the people that we serve and for it to be more of a service type of thing rather than a retail, this is what we sell. No, what do we really bring to the table in terms of culture? Um, I love some of the taglines, so, some of my favorites. And, and when I talk to DSOs about what is your mission or your vision, so many of them are so benign or it's like the same thing everybody says. We want great patient care. Well, of course you do. But are you really fulfilling that? So if you can spend time really crunching and massaging and wordsmithing what you really want to stand for, how would you differentiate yourself? So just to give you some fun examples. So, for example, I think it's Walgreens. I mean, they're a drugstore. There's a million drugstores. But their theme is uh, on the corner of happy and healthy. And I just love that because it's so short. Um, you want something that is so short and to the point that anybody in your company can read it. Mm. Um, so on the corner of happy and healthy, well, it stands for health. But they also have a lot of other stuff that will make you happy, like, you know, cosmetics and things. And they're everywhere on the corner. They're convenient. Mm-hmm. So um, another one is the Ritz Carlton's motto is we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Mm. If you ever been to a Ritz Carlton and ask somebody the way to the restroom or to, you know, you're meeting somebody for lunch, where's the restaurant? They will not tell you where it is. They will escort you there. And even if you say, oh, no, 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 that's okay. I'm, no, 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 no. We will be happy to escort you, which mm. gives them an opportunity to then further the conversation and give you a better experience. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then at the other end, you've got the targets of the world. And I love target as well. And they are, um, uh, expect more, pay less. So I love, so how does that translate into a great DSO logo? And one of our biggest DSOs, hundreds of practices, their theme is very, very short, their mission, and it smiles for everyone. Now, when you first think about that, and I, I thought, well, that makes sense. You know, they want smiles for all of their patients. That makes sense. But as I was pointed out to me by my friend that I was working there, she said, no, Janet, it's not just patients. That's the obvious part. But every decision we make has to be good for our team as well, because we have to take just as good care of our team as we take care of our patients. So it has to be, is this a good t- a decision for our team also? And then she said, and then plus, It has to be good for our investors also. Mm. So all the way up and down the chain, and they also have extended that globally. They have a Smiles for Everyone Foundation. They go to underserved countries to help deliver dentistry there. So that is to me is such a perfect example of taking, you know, what you want to do and how you want to serve people in your community, whether it's your local community or expanded community, uh, drilling it down to wordsmithing to come up with some powerful, uh, short phrases that everybody should be able to remember. You should, everybody should know what it is and be able to repeat it uh, easily. So a culture, a mission, and then the different types of technical in dentistry, it's clinical, and then business and communication technologies. So You know, artificial intelligence is a fascinating subject to me. We're seeing a lot of it in dentistry. And as much as we grow technically, that's more of a need for soft skills. Mm -hmm. So the more technical we get, the more soft skills we need. So and we need to have specific um, protocols in place. You can't teach people that have soft skills. Um, that's, that's, that's not hard to do. And that's what I do with my selling dentistry. It's all about soft skills. So it's a marriage between utilizing the, t- the amazing technology that we have now. Uh, you know, when you go to get a, a dental work done, you don't need to have that goppy, goopy stuff in your mouth for an impression anymore. There are scanners. They take this thing that looks like a wand mm-hmm. and they just scan it in the, around the inside of your mouth. No more gagging on the goop. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, implants. Who would have thought 100 years ago you could stick a screw in somebody's extracted site and a couple months later put a fake tooth on it and it's like you don't even know it's there. Mm. So the technology is amazing. How do we 
transfer that to serve our patients in a way that they're grateful and happy for it. Um, so I think that was a long round answer to That's your question, but I think there definitely are, of course, similarities between how do you set up the foundational building blocks for uh, a dental group um, is not all that different from any other type of, of company that you want to scale. Folks, we're here chatting with Janet Hagerman, and she is with DSO's Done Right. So, Janet, you you kind of sideswiped this a little bit early in our in our talk, but um, our interview here. But let's talk about the particularities of the COVID environment, the pandemic that we're in, how that affects communications issues for DSOs. For sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me let me share with your listeners that um, at this point in time, we've been dealing with what we call universal precautions for years. Um, when the AIDS epidemic exploded, uh, we had a whole new look at, you know, uh, how we look at, at patients. And what we had to say was um, some offices said, you know, we don't want to deal with patients that have AIDS. Others said, how do you know? Because not everybody's diagnosed. So you have to take the, the um, um, we want to care for all of our patients and we want to do that in a way. So we assume that everybody has it and we take universal precautions. Mm -hmm. And so we have had to bump up those precautions with COVID. But I, I would venture to say there's no safer place to be than in a dental office because we have been so conditioned uh, for, for years that this, this is what we've been doing. And we just bumped up that protocol mm -hmm. now. Um, the other thing I, I want people to know is there is such an important connection between the oral cavity and the rest of the body. I mean, it seems obvious, but it is the portal to the rest of your body. And we now know that there are definite connections between infection in the mouth and um, it's connected to heart disease. It is connected to diabetes. It is connected to obesity. And it is connected to preterm births. So it is imperative that we keep a healthy mouth um, if we have other predisposing conditions. And this is what we found with COVID. The people who are most at risk were people who had other predisposing conditions. All the more reason to visit your dentist regularly and keep a healthy oral cavity. So um, uh, I would say... Um, Yes, keep that up. Uh, go <laughs> visit your dentist regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point in time, I, I think that the dental practices have certainly more of a handle on the uh, safety of um, preventing this disease. Uh, you know, people are not wearing masks as much as they should in public. They're not social distancing. So um, those are the things that we need to do until we get past this particular virus. Uh, my own personal opinion is there are going to be more viruses. Viruses are part of the planet. Um, they're going to continue to mutate. So, you know, we, we need to also be looking at prevention, kind of getting off on a, a, a tangent here. But um, the best the best prevention is having a healthy immune system. So, you know, what do we eat? What do we drink? Do we exercise? So um, keeping that immune system strong. Mm hmm. But um, throughout COVID, uh, as I as I said, I think the DSO industry, the leadership was just phenomenal in um, what they brought to the table, the things that we saw on LinkedIn, the podcasts, uh, supporting everybody in dentistry has been um, re a remarkable testament to the quality of the people that are involved in, in DSOs and group dentistry and dental support organizations today. Just phenomenal, I think. Janet, you, you have been um, in and around the industry for a long time, worked with a lot of different clients. I would love it if you would share a success story that you're particularly proud of uh, in, in, your, in your time. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I that I like to work with, one of the things that's a challenge, and uh, this is not unique to DSOs, but this is what happens. Um, you take uh, somebody who's very good. 
this happens with salespeople too. Somebody's a great salesperson, so you make them the manager of the sales team. The only problem is they don't have management skills. They're a great salesperson, but they can't teach somebody else how to do it. Mm. So in dentistry, we look at top producers. A dentist who um, who did a lot of dentistry was very productive, or a hygienist that did. And then we start to elevate them in management positions. We make them a mentor for other people. The problem is, do they have good, do they have good mentoring skills? Do they have good training skills? And then we elevate them to maybe the director of hygiene or the, a, a clinical director. The problem is, do they have the kind of skills to let them understand at a certain point, where do I need to learn how to delegate? At what point do I need an assistant so I'm not running around doing these trivial things that only I can do, but I could actually delegate it to somebody else? Because I'm needed more for my expertise philosophically. Um, how do I look at metrics, the numbers, and turn them into a um, clinical learning teaching moment mm. to teach somebody how to change their clinical approach um, that's going to result in better patient care, which ultimately always results in better productivity and revenue. So how do you teach that? So that's probably my, my best success is being able to help those types of people traverse that journey, if you will, um, to uh, learning how to be a manager, how to deal with peers. So at one point, the CEO, let's say, of the company was your boss, the company, the guy that ran the whole company or the woman that ran the whole company. But now you're old, you're up on that C-suite level. How do you change your approach to deal with somebody that you're now peer to peer? Mm -hmm. You're now counting on you to be an advisor, much like the president surrounds himself with a, a group of advisors because they don't have all the answers. So how do you, um, or how are you able to switch your demeanor uh, your uh, the skills that you bring to that table from here I was a clinician and you ran a company to now I'm helping to run a company. Mm. So how do you how do you change those clinical skills and evolve to management skills? Um, that's where I've had a su success and I, it's like watching it's like watching a flower bloom. I'm big in nature and I, I'm, a, I'm a floral designer uh, in Ikebana style, which is Japanese floral design. And I've written a book called The Little Book of Bloom, Nature's Steps to um, Improving Your, uh, Maximizing Your Own Personal Potential. So it's like watching, you know, coaching somebody or a team is like watching a garden bloom. You plant the seeds, you, you, you um, prepare the soil properly and then, you know, you watch it bloom. It's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if we got time to talk about all the books you've written. I mean, you just keep casually throwing out, I've written a book about this. <laughs> <laughs> two, actually. Oh, okay. two, but the third one is on the way. Okay. Okay. Well, that, oh, uh, congratulations on that. Cause that's a gleam in some folks eyes just to get the first one out and you're working on number three. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Um, but now Janet, this has been great. And, uh, I know there's some folks out there that would, probably like to be in touch with you after hearing some of the things that you said and how you can be helpful. Uh, so let's get to your contact information. How can folks connect with you? Sure. I love that. I would love for anybody to connect with me that has any interest in what you and I have um, talked about this morning. Um, my website is janethagerman.com. It's J A N E T H A G E R M A N one G. Uh, just JanetHagerman.com is my website, and it's got information on there about uh, the whole DSO situation uh, and what I can do for that, and then also the selling dentistry. If people are interested in more of that, uh, you can get the books there as well as on um, on Amazon. And then also, if you want to just reach out to me on LinkedIn, on, on LinkedIn, just type in my name, and I'll pop up, and and we'll connect. And um, for anybody interested, I'm always happy to do complimentary 30-minute uh, coaching calls or sort of a discovery call, get acquainted and see if, um, you know, the needs of you match what I can do to help. And if not, maybe I know somebody else that can help. So um, Awesome. 
Janet Hagerman, folks, uh, with DSOs Done Right. Janet, thanks so much for being with us. John, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Folks, just a quick reminder that uh, if you've got some help that you need that involves like maybe all your receipts are in a shoebox and your bookkeeping is a mess, or maybe maybe you've got some uh, needs that involve administrative tasks that uh, you need to get off your plate and get onto someone else's plate. Well, I've got an answer that involves picking up the phone, calling Essie Escobedo over at Office Angels. Now, I work with Essie myself, and she's awesome. 770-442-9246. She's got a team of angels at her firm, Office Angels, that will fly in, get the job done, and fly out. And they've been working virtually for 18 years, so they know how this works, this current environment works. So um, give her a call, explain your problem, and she'll help you with it. Officeangels.us is the website, 770-442-9246. And, folks, you can find our show, North Fulton Business Radio, on all the major podcast apps. I'm, I'm quit mentioning them because we're on all of them. North Fulton Business Radio is the search term. Find us, subscribe. We would love it if you'd give us a re- great review because it helps folks find the show, and it's not about me or us, it's about our guests because we love to promote our guests. So it helps people uh, find our great guests like Janet and the, and uh, find the good work that they do and benefit from that. So we would appreciate your help there. And please connect with us on social media as well, North Fulton BRX. We're on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So for my guest, Janet Hagerman, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.